In our previous videos in this section, we covered how to move around the, the file system, what the Unix file system looks like in this tree-like structure, how to inspect text files, and of course, how to create and edit new text files. And hopefully that's uh, beginning to make sense and it's all fine and dandy for you, but the question really remains, how do we do actual work here in Unix? How do we accomplish the kind of tasks that we need to do for our research work? Well, frequently what we have to do is we have to turn to these special so-called pipe and redirect commands. Now mastering these that I'm highlighting here in this little table of our key Unix commands will give us Unix superpowers because what they'll do is they'll allow us to combine lots of individual programs together to accomplish workflows, to accomplish new things that we couldn't accomplish before. Now recall of course that the power of the shell really lies in this ability to combine simple utilities, that is commands, into more complex algorithms very quickly. And a key element of being able to do this is the ability to send the output from one command into a file or even better to pass it directly into the input of another program. And this is the job of these special characters, these redirection characters, the so-called more than or less than characters, and the pipe command, which is the vertical dash there on, on your keyboard. So to understand how to make use of this kind of super useful feature of, the, of Unix, there are two important concepts we need to introduce at this point. That is, where the output and input for these Unix programs normally comes from or goes to. This is so-called standard output and standard input. Now normally, standard output, it comes right back at you when you enter your command, right? You type ls on the command line and the output, the listing of the current directory that you're in is right back out at you underneath in the terminal. It comes right back to the terminal. And the same is true for standard input. Normally it comes from the command line itself. For example, if we typed ls and we told it a directory we wanted to list, like our desktop, it's gonna take that as input from the command line. That's the standard input. So that's shown here. Uh, graphically where we have our program in the middle that's going to be ls and we're going to give it some input and standard in that's the desktop so we want it to list out the files and folders or, or directories in other words that are in this desktop location that's what standard in is and standard output is going to come right back at us here to the screen to the terminal itself now do that for yourself and hopefully you should see a direct a directory listing of your desktop now it doesn't have to go back, that standard output doesn't have to go to the screen, we can redirect it to a file. And for that, we're gonna use this little more than symbol and then the name of the file you want this to appear in. So in my case, I'm calling it mylist.txt and that will be a new file that will be created that will contain the output of our running this ls program. And so it didn't spin back at me anymore, but if I look inside this file, I can see here they are listed. Tidy bloopers one courses. All there. Of course, so that created a, an independent file there that you can see. I'm going to remove the mylist.txt. Now we can also use the pipe operator to pipe this directly to less, for example. So there'll be no intermediate file like the mylist.txt created in this case. We're gonna take the output from ls and pipe it directly in to this less program to list it out for us. Now we can also give optional input arguments. There's other inputs to these programs. These are the, the arguments similar to those we had in R with, with our function arguments. Here I'm gonna change the way ls works. I'm gonna tell it to list it with the minus L input argument and that will give me some more details like the file size, who owns the file and its permissions and things like that. And again, in this case, standard output is going right back to us to the shell. Now, I can also run this with um, an error message. So if I try and list the contents of a directory that doesn't exist, like in this case, you know, no directory exists here, now it's gonna spit right back at me to the terminal, but I can redirect that with a special more than symbol with a two in front of it, because this is the second output. The standard output is the first, and we could write one more than, but 
we don't need to so we can just use the single more than symbol but technically that that's correct to write the one more than and the second output here the standard error which it keeps separate from the standard output for very good reasons because it allows you to keep track of which programs have uh, problems or error messages that are occurring and it's not interspersed with all your output from your big analysis and you might miss these error messages it'll keep them separate for you to investigate at a, at, uh, at a separate uh, kind of junction or separate time point in summary let's recap here we run the program ls with its standard input here coming from the desktops and we give it a, an optional argument minus l in this case and both the standard output and the standard error came right back to the terminal as shown here with these uh, ladder green and red arrows here now we didn't need to have the standard output going back to the terminal we could redirect it with the more than symbol to a file in this case one called list of files so that's where that goes not to the terminal any longer and now with the pipe operator we start to get a little bit more useful pipe will take the standard output of one command for example this ls command and we'll run it through another program for example here grep which will search the the, the contents of files or the file names in this case for a, a match to a particular string for example a bit like the r command grep that we covered in one of our previous labs that's inspired by this unix command and this allows us to combine these things so search for a directory of files for example that match some particular pattern that we're after so grep it'll print lines containing a string it'll also search the strings within these text files as shown here now please give that a try yourself and see if you can get this working on your file system with your contents and your files and what we're talking about here grep of course is one of these power commands one of these indispensable yeah unix power commands that allows us to up our game here in the unix world but the key point that, that we don't want to get away from here is that disk io that's the input output which is often a bottleneck in data processing especially in the mathematics field where we're dealing with many many small files often but lots of them it can be avoided right these pipes and redirects avoid unnecessary writing and reading from disk by connecting the standard output of one process to the standard input of another and they're frequently called streams so we have streams of data running through these pipes for example so program one here will run an input text and the error will go to a separate error file but the output will go to program two which in turn will go to our results file so pipes and redirects they really allow us to build solutions from these modular parts that work with standard in and standard output streams and this brings us back to what we had back in our first video in this section the unix philosophy where we've now got the second part of the unix philosophy write programs of course that do one thing and do it well and that work well together but also that handle text streams that's the standard input and standard output and standard error because that is a universal interface in this unix world so again it's much like the the, the plumbing section of that hardware store these things will work together and we can stream our data through them and avoid unnecessary reading and writing to temporary files at each step of our analysis for example so to give you a little bit of context and maybe an extreme example of this i want to mention a famous kind of anecdote back in the days you know pre kind of internet forums and pre-stack overflow there were magazines that would be published and have a readership of, of uh, folks that are interested in these kind of developments in computing and one of those was uh, called communications of the acm magazine it asked this famous computer scientist donald Kunz to write a simple program to count and print the k most common words in a file alongside their counts in decreasing order to really showcase how you would do it in this kind of literate programming paradigm that he was a pioneer of at that time and so he wrote back uh, and this was published in the magazine it was a beautiful kind of seven page long solution that was highly customized to the problem right it was one of these monster approaches really that we talked about back in the first video in our series he implemented for example custom data structures for counting english words and that maybe wouldn't work so well with other languages for example now 
Doug McElroy, the the person here whose quote we had earlier, he wrote back in typical style and replied with one line that did the same thing faster. Right? He used existing Unix commands, so he didn't have to write anything new. And this one line accomplished exactly the same stuff in a fraction of the time. He took uh, the input text, the input uh, words in the in the file. He passed it to translate, right, to change all lowercase, uh, all uppercase to lowercase letters here. Then he, he would sort them, so sort to the same uh, words as on consecutive lines here. And then they would keep uh, only unique occurrences of those words with a count, that's the minus C there, the count of the occurrences, and then pipe that to sort, and that would sort it in reverse order, that's the minus R flag there, uh, and, and numeric order with a minus N, and then pipe that to said to print the 10, in this case, uh, most frequent lines in this case, and then quit. So that is a, an extreme example of one of these, of course, pipes here to do really a, you know, a custom task that would take you a lot longer to do without these kind of modular uh, blocks that we have in the Unix world to work with text. And remember, bioinformatics, we're all about text. It's all characters and strings, whether it's amino acids or nucleotides or structural data and coordinates. It's a lot of text files that we're manipulating and moving around and uh, and searching for patterns in. So Unix is a great environment to do that kind of work, of course. So the key point here again is you can combine and chain any number of programs together. They don't have to be translate and, and unique and sort, but they could be Blast and uh, FastQC and whatever other uh, genomics programs you're going to, going to be running and put them together to build fairly complex workflows on the on the command line here. Now in our hands-on session we're going to get a lot more practice with combining uh, commands but also critically we're going to get experience of accessing remote computers. In this case we're going to access Amazon Web Services and Jetstream instances. These are basically computers in the cloud that have way more horsepower than our own machines our little laptops typically here at home or in the computer labs on campus and they'll allow us to do a lot more computationally demanding work. Now all these computers are Unix based, they're all Linux machines in fact that, that we've, that we've uh, built just like your lab servers that you might use for some of your more advanced work but these will have way more horsepower than those typically so they'll allow us to analyze bigger data sets in shorter time frames. Okay, we're also going to get exposure there you know, to connect into these machines, as I've said. So that's the job of typically SSH, which stands for Secure Shell, that will open up a connection to these remote machines if you give it your username and the address of the machine itself. And then its partner in crime is SCP for Secure Copy. That really allows you to copy data back and forth from these remote machines. We're... Uh, going to use these in, in, the, in the simple kind of way where we have SSH, your username at the host address. For example, if I was logging into one of my ma lab machines, my account is Barry at the name of the machine, its address. For us, you know, you would substitute your username and the host address that we provide to you on, on Piazza, for example. And we'll probably use a private key, this kind of crypto cryptography magic where it matches a file that you have in your computer along with one that's on the remote computer to ensure that uh, we are connecting and we have the access permissions to connect here. So we're going to use SSH minus I, the private key that we distribute to you, your username and the remote IP address of your instance in the cloud. And then you'll be in the shell logged in to those remote computers and able to do your, your work, your bioinformatics work. So you're also going to get exposure to some basic process control commands. These will allow you to inspect what processes, basically jobs, are running on your computer and how to kill them and how to uh, manipulate them to go into the background so you can do other work or bring them to the foreground or suspend them with the control Z or kill them with control C uh, commands there. And then finally, we're going to also uh, get uh, 
uh, exposure to some new commands that are specific to the Linux operating system, like apt-get for installing software, curl uh, that you can use on any Unix machine, typically for downloading data from a web address and for uncompressing. And then we'll use some mathematics tools like Blast and, and tools for ortholog mapping and tools for genomics as well. So we're going to get exposure to all these commands and build up our repertoire of, of these essential key Unix commands for doing our work. Now, why do we have this big table that we had earlier on of all these you know, 20 odd or 22 odd key Unix commands that we're exposing you to? Well, it's because you know many Bathmatics tools, they can only be used through a command line interface or they have extra capabilities, for example, that can only be accessed through the command line versions. They're not available in any graphical user interface. This is true even for you know good old Blast, which offers many advanced functions that are only accessible to users who know how to use it on the shell. You can't do it through NCBI that way or through any other approach. You have to download it and get it working on your own uh, Unix hardware here at the shell. So the shell, of course, will also make your work more reproducible. That's like you carry out your work in the command line rather than a than a GUI graphical user interface, your computer will keep a record of every single step that you've carried out, which you can then use to redo your work. You can write a so-called shell script and automate it. This will also give you a way to communicate unambiguously what you're you're doing so that others can check your work and of course apply your process and your workflow to new data or their own data, for example. And then finally, many, many bioinformatics tasks that will come to in our research, they require large amounts of computing power and just can't realistically be run on your own machines. These tasks are best performed using remote computers or cloud computing like we'll do in the hands-on session. And these can only be accessed through a shell. Those lab servers that you'll go to, you have to use a shell to access them and run uh, your jobs on them. Same with AWS, Amazon Web Services, or Jetstream, these NSF computers that we have access to. There's no other way to connect to them efficiently. Uh, and so we have to use this Unix environment to do that because all those top computers are Unix based. So with that, we'll finish here and thank you for your attention.